So Jesus, uh, we want to, uh, again, just continue to be in your presence, and uh, we want to thank you for the gifts that you do give to us and the, gift that, the gifts that you're going to continue to give to us. There's something about uh, the Big C Church. Um, so uh, Jesus, we would just want to thank you for the gifts of your true body, your true blood that strengthen us, that we, uh, again, we, we, we're strengthened to follow you, we're strengthened to believe in you, we're strengthened to have uh, faith, we're, we're, you, you keep uh, bringing us in, bringing us in, and so Jesus, we look to you to continue to do that. So as we uh, um, think about and open up the Word of God through the book of Acts this morning, Again, may the Spirit stir us as it stirred the people that uh, wrote these stories down, the, the people that lived these stories out, uh, real people, people like us. And um, so, Jesus, we're looking for you to continue to do something in us and through us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So, again, just want to uh, draw a circle. And the whole idea of a circle, um, when it comes to this big C church, or we talk about the, the uh, God's kingdom that's ever warmly expanding in us, through us, all around us, and way beyond us. The, the whole idea here this, this morning is that there are people that come from outside and move inside of the church. So again, when Jesus comes and he forms this gathering of his disciples, then we read in the book of Acts, there's about 120 other believers when uh, they came together on, on Pentecost. But there's always some, so many uh, people outside of the church uh, that, that J Jesus is looking to bring into the church. And sometimes one of the ways that we look at it is that, you know, there are, um, uh, th that the church need, that people from the outside need to come to the inside. But there's another way to think about this is that really the, the church keeps reaching out and gathering other people into it. And so there's still always people out here. So there's this idea that the, the title of the message this morning, it's a, a wider circle, a, a wider circle. We're, we're going to see how that uh, takes place in the book of Acts this morning. Um, but let me uh, do a couple of things um, this morning. As we're, so again, uh, Jesus is in. He's in the circle. He is for this circle. Jesus is for that circle getting every, ever wider so that there can be more people inside the circle, inside uh, the, the, the faith. Um, so this, uh, how I did, the Big C Church, that God's kingdom is always going to be expanding, expanding up, up right up into... So the goal of the Big C Church, always the goal, since it began on Pentecost uh, almost 2,000 years ago to t today, is that, that people outside will be in. Jesus is always wanting that circle to get wider so that more and more people can be inside of the circle of, of church. Um, so this idea that uh, souls matter that are out. Souls matter that are out. For some of us who are sitting here this morning, it wasn't too long ago that maybe your soul was more out than in. Uh, maybe for some of us, you, you, we're, we're going to be th thinking about this, that you know about this Jesus, but as far as following Jesus, part of maybe being a member or being a part, being a living uh, follower of Jesus, a disciple of him inside of a church, that hasn't always been a part of your story. So the church is getting, have been doing this wider circle deal so that you would come. So again, we want to be a church that's always looking to the edges. Who's, who's someone that maybe the, the God will be gracious and widen the circle to include that person, just as God has been gracious and widen the circle to include those of us who are here this morning. There, there's a sense that all of us here this morning, we were at one time maybe a little more out than in. Over the last number of weeks, kind of since uh, uh, the Sunday of Easter, uh, as we've gotten into this, uh, the, into the, the book of Acts, we've been tracking along with AD, the Bible Continues, this series, this 12-week series on NBC on Sunday nights. And again, if you haven't been watching it, um, boy, I hope at some point you will. Uh, those of us who have been watching it, it just keeps moving uh, me over and over again. Uh, but we've said... Uh, since, since that time, in, in reading the book of Acts, the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts, that's kind of what the storyline is going to continue on with this AD, the Bible continues. But we've said that there was a pattern of preaching, 
established in the book of Acts. Kind of the preaching the good news as this, uh, as kind of this whole idea of it starting to expand. Uh, they always kind of said the same thing. And then people from the outside would come in as they heard this preaching of the good news. So the pattern has always been you've heard of Jesus. So there wasn't anybody in the audience in that first Acts 2, what, what Acts chapter 2 covers, there's no one in the audience that day that have not heard about Jesus. And so the, 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 uh, Peter, when he gets up and he starts giving this pattern, he starts talking about Jesus. And a part of what he says, you've all heard some of the stories of Jesus. Again, there are people from all kinds of different uh, uh, countries, different backgrounds. Again, the, they're, they're all Jews. But they're from different countries because, again, over the centuries, uh, the, the Jewish nation got dispersed into all kinds of countries and that. And, and so, uh, and so it, even uh, today, the, the, there's no one in this room that hasn't heard about Jesus. You may not follow him as the Lord and Savior. You may not, you know, kind of have come to that point yet. But you've heard about Jesus. You celebrate Christmas. You know, you know about Easter. In fact, I just go so far to say this this morning. Really, we live in a time that no matter where people are in in this world, they've all heard about Jesus. You go to the remote, most remote place in South America or in Africa or in China, people have heard about Jesus. We've, we support here at New Hope, we support uh, someone who works for Crew, uh, used to be Campus Crusade for Christ. He serves in a city in western China of a million that you've never heard of before. And he is working with students at a university there. They've heard about this Jesus, but they don't know what to do with him. So again, the, the, it's always that, that way. You've heard about Jesus, but then the pattern that Peter will, and we'll get to cover this, and then just the details, assign even the, the verses to it. Um, you've heard about this G Jesus, but on this first Pentecost, Jesus, uh, Peter will say, and you crucified him. We were thinking about that a few weeks ago. How all of us in this room, we are a part of the reason why Jesus was crucified. We've been a part of that. You crucified him. Not directly, but indirectly, we're a part of why Jesus had to be crucified. But then Peter would go on and say, but God raised him. But God raised him. And then the invitation is, is to come from out to in. So let's come follow Jesus with us. It's what matters most. Come follow Jesus with us. It's what matters most. So we've been looking at that pattern. We're looking at that pattern a little bit again uh, today. And it's the pattern that just going to continue through the book of Acts. You've heard about Jesus. You crucified him. Say you're sorry. God raised him. Or I'm sorry. I'm getting this wrong here. Uh, I'm, I'm messing up the pattern. Um, so you've heard about Jesus. You crucified him. Uh, God raised him. Say you're sorry. Come follow Jesus with us. It's what matters most. So briefly, I just want to consider this pattern, kind of this idea from out to in, how it continues to happen even in our day. So let's follow Jesus together. It's what matters most. Why? Why would we do that? Why do we need to follow Jesus? Well, we know that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And there's a way that really none of us like to think about this idea that we are lost or have been lost. There's a lot that, um, again, especially for those of us who live in this time, in this place of America. There are a lot of people that won't be in a church today because they just believe they're good people. They're, they're not someone that is in prison or going to prison. They're not someone that's on the low side of the economic uh, totem pole. They're, they're not the wealthiest, but they're just good people. They know about Jesus. They're going to celebrate Christmas when it comes around again. They're going to be nice. They're going to obey the law. They're going to pay their taxes. They're going to, you know, they're going to complain about having to pay their taxes. They're going to complain about the road construction. So they just know about how to be good, and they don't, wouldn't think that they're lost. But they're outside. You know them. I know them. Maybe some of you know it really wasn't too long ago that you were outside and those were some of the thoughts that you had. Again, you knew about the Jesus. You celebrate Christmas. But there's things that have happened that sort of, I don't know how much I really want to 
get in. And so uh, we've kind of, so Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, and I'm one of them that he came to seek and to save. I think you're one of them that he's come to seek and to save. And then the next question would be, how did he do it? How did he do it? Again, kind of all the things that we know about Jesus, all the things, again, for many of us, we've maybe known for a long time. Uh, if, especially if you maybe grew up in the church, you probably would hear, didn't matter what Christian church, any, any church, the Catholic, the Methodist, a non-denominational, a, a Lutheran, a Baptist. We all heard about, you know, the stories of Jesus, that he was born. I mean, that's the whole Christmas thing. That he ended up going to the cross and dying. He was put in a tomb. Three days later, he rose. And then he ascended to heaven, and he's coming again. We, we know all that about Jesus. That's kind of how he has done it. Do we believe that somehow that, that circle that Jesus has made possible through all those actions that we need to believe those things and follow those things and realize that, again, kind of the wonders for, for me and maybe for, for you is that you know, all these things that God promised, he promised, he promised, he promised, he promised, that all those things have come true, they've come true, they've come true, they've come true, except kind of for this last one that Jesus is coming again. We're going to see as we read through the portion of uh, Acts chapter 8 that we're going to read here in a little bit that um, th this, this promise is a part of what makes it possible for people to keep coming from, to the faith, that they go from out in. We're, we're going to see how the church would start looking to the edges, and they're going to bring pre people that were out to, to uh, in. So how did he uh, do this? He, he did it through all those actions that we know about. And the other thought, then we'll uh, move on here, is that Jesus is always Lord of this big C church. He's always Lord. He, he's the one that wants the church to keep looking to the edges and then expand to bring those people in. He's always the Lord. He's been the Lord of the church since day one. And he's still the Lord of the church today. He's Lord of this church. And he wants us to be a church that's getting a wider circle. He wants us to be a church that's really involved in this whole idea of God's kingdom is ever warmly expanding in us and then through us and then all around us and way beyond us. Jesus is Lord of the church. So again, as we said in the prayer after uh, uh, communion, was that uh, today is Pentecost Sunday, and so we're 50 days after Easter Sunday. And we're going to look for a moment at Acts chapter 2. I've kind of already mentioned it. Peter, he gets up uh, in Acts chapter 2. He talks about this Jesus. You've all heard about Jesus. It's this Jesus, it's what matters most, this Jesus, knowing this Jesus, and not just knowing him, but kind of being in with Jesus. It's what matters most. You crucified him. Again, he's going to make that real, real parent. You crucified him. God raised him. Say you're sorry. And now come follow Jesus with us. It's what matters most. So in Acts chapter 2, we read kind of from verses 14 to 36. It's all about consider this Jesus, consider this Jesus. And uh, Peter, in this message in Acts chapter 2, maybe you can read it later today if the storms start hitting that they're predicting in that and he can't go outside and do some stuff in that. Maybe you want to read Acts chapter 2 or maybe tomorrow or maybe this, uh, this week. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 36. Uh, Peter has all these words about Jesus. You've heard about him. You know what happened not too many days uh, before now with him being cr uh, crucified. And you crucified him, but God raised him. Now say you're sorry. Uh, he's going to qu quote some of the Old Testament prophets about how the promise that they made back then is true in Jesus. And then in verse uh, 37, uh, kind of the, the, the people ask this question, what shall we do? What shall we do? And in verse 38, Peter gives the answer, repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the edges expand that day. And the circle expands that day because we read that about 3,000 do it. 3,000 go from out to in on that day. And then the story of the book of Acts is just how that circle continues to get wider and wider and wider. So again, I think that pattern is still a real similar pattern to those of us who are 
in the church, who are coming into the church. Uh, we're, we're a church, again, that wants to be looking to the edges and how can we bring those people that are kind of out to in. So we're always going to have to deal with Jesus. Who is this Jesus? How do we consider him? There, there, there's more to being in than just knowing about Jesus. Knowing about Christmas, knowing about Easter, knowing about some of the things that Jesus said and did. So there's this encounter with Jesus, and always when there's this encounter with Jesus, for those that come in, there's always kind of a bump. There's, there's a shift that Jesus does in us. We've talked about this before in kind of the history of New Hope, and again, we're going to continue, we're going to be thinking about this a lot next week, but there's always this idea that Jesus kind of, he, he just kind of nudges us, he bumps into us, he, because his, our souls matter. He wants us in. Jesus wants us in. He wants people that are still out in. So he wants us in. So he's going to bump us. He's going to shift into us. There's going to be some kind of action. Again, next week we're going to think about that a whole lot more and how it happened with the person that, of Saul. Again, if you've been watching AD, the Bible continues. They've got us hating Saul because he's just kind of foaming at the mouth and he's, he beats up Christians he's, he, and he doesn't care if it's men or women that he's beating up. He doesn't care about their children that maybe sometimes are being beaten up or taken and arrested and there's some of them they are going to be even probably uh, put to death. Uh, Jesus bumps into him in a way that uh, he shifts going from out to in and he's going to stay in and uh, we're here in some ways, because of how good Paul was at communicating how it is that followers of Jesus can stay in over their lifetime once they're in. And then, the, 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 so that you know about Jesus, there's this bump, there's this shift. And then live a life of faith following this Jesus. We live a life of faith following this Jesus. And we're in, we're in, we're in. We live a life of faith following this Jesus. So in God's kingdom, this big C church is ever warmly expanding in us, through us, all around us and way beyond us. We follow the God. We are following God. We're being invited to follow God. We're being invited in to follow this God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, be out, but would have eternal life in. That's the God we follow on this Pentecost Sunday, on this Memorial Day weekend. So again, this big C church, always a circle getting wider and wider and wider. Two things. Look to the edges. Look to the edges. People that are not like us. People of different color. People of different um, beliefs. Uh, people of different lifestyles. Look to those edges. Because Jesus knows that those people out on those edges have souls that matter and they're out and he wants them in. So look to the edges, look to the edges. And then the second thing is just realize that this big C church, this ever warmly expanding kingdom of God is going to get wider and keep expanding. So I want to go to Acts chapter 8, beginning with uh, verse 4. We looked at these uh, kind of first number of verses uh, last week, but I want to just briefly go over them again with you. In Acts chapter 8, we read, beginning at verse 4, those who had been scattered, we talked about that last week, the whole idea of scattered, that it would seem like that word scattered would be a kind of a negative word, that they were forced to scatter. Again, we use that uh, 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 most of the time when we would think about scattered, we'd probably use it in a sentence like this. All the contents of the, heart of the house was scattered all over because of the tornado. Then again, Paul and the persecution that came was kind of a, a tornado against the church. It would seem that they were scattered. But God is always in his church. And so it was scattered. They're going to be scattered to preach the good news. To go out to the edges and to see the circle getting wider. So it says, um, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. I mean, that's positive. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. 
And we kind of said this next verse would probably freak us out as Americans, as white people and stuff, as people that are following Jesus. With shrieks and evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. We'd kind of say, okay, Jesus, we believe you, but if you ever do that in front of us, I don't know if we're staying yet. You'll freak us out. Uh, but it, again, we just know that it, it kind of happened. That's the, the, it, um, but, but in verse 8 it says, and probably this would happen in, in front of us, um, it says there was great joy in that city. Because they just kind of thought they were out. But Jesus is doing something that says that they might just be uh, in. Then uh, it continues on in verse 9. For some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. So they, again, these people know about God, but it's kind of this generic big guy in the sky kind of deal. And this Simon um, and was this sorcery. So he had some tricks. He, was, uh, he kind of deluded the pe people. He deceived the people. So they followed him because, again, they didn't know how he was doing it. But when they, when they ever do it, they would sort of, oh, hey, wow, you know. Um, so they're, they're following this, uh, this guy. Um, so they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic, with his deception, with his tricks, with his sleight of hand. Uh, maybe with setting some things up that were basically deceptive. Or, uh, uh, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, so Philip came in and said, you know, you, you've heard about Jesus, and even though they're in Samaria, they've heard about Jesus. You've heard that he went to Jerusalem and he died on the cross, he rose. That's why I'm here. We're a part of why he is crucified. But God raised him. You're hearing that story. Say you're sorry. And come follow Jesus with us. So he's preaching about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. They were baptized, both men and women. And, and wonder, kind of, this is a, a big deal. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Simon knew that when he was impressing people, it was through deception. But as he was watching Philip... And knowing some of the people that some of these miracles actually happened in, he knew something more was there. So it says uh, uh, he saw these great signs and, and the miracles. He's, he, uh, again, again, just for a moment, this kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. The kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. This kingdom of God is going to be ever warmly expanding. And it's always going to come through this name of Jesus. So again, the church is practicing, is, is starting out, looking to the edges, looking to the edges, and watching the circles expand so that people who are out can come in. Now in verse 14 it says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria, again, we have read earlier, that when this persecution started and the people started to scatter, the, the apostles were able to stay in Jerusalem. In A.D., the Bible continues, kind of shows the apostles sort of hiding in Jerusalem, but also still doing the, the work of the kingdom, the work of the, uh, uh, um, uh, advancing uh, the message of Jesus. So when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Peter and John to the Samaritans. Now, last week and this week, or last week I didn't really cover this whole idea of Samaritans. Again, we're Americans, we just kind of think, you know, it doesn't matter if we're, there's people in Africa that we end up interacting with or people in China that we end up Af a a interacting with or in uh, South America. And, you know, because we're Americans, we, we, we kind of, you know, even though there's lots of racial tension and divisions and stuff, yet there's also a lot of this idea that, you know, we, in, in every public school, we've got people from all sorts of different races and that. Um, there's different languages that may, may be spoken in home. So we just kind of know about this, but this whole idea of Samaria, they're the northern part of Israel, and for centuries, Samaritans had killed Jews, and Jews had killed Samaritans, even though they're still all, all Jews, but there's just this tension, there's just this cultural tension, this religious tension, there's just, just all, for centuries and centuries and centuries. But now, here's some of the first Outreaches going to the edges. The gospel is going into Samaria, as Jesus said. When you look through the gospels, in the gospel of John and in the gospel of Luke, there are these encounters 
with Samaritans. In John chapter 4, Jesus has the longest conversation recorded anywhere else in the, in the gospel with a woman at the well who is a Samaritan. She comes. To, again, many of you know the story. If you, if you don't, you can tell real, real, real quick. Jesus says to her as she comes out in the middle of the day to get water, most of the women from a village would come out early in the morning when it's still cool, not in the blazing heat of the day. So there's a reason that this woman is alone. Jesus engages her. She's shocked that a Jewish man, she knows that he's a Jew, would speak to a woman who's obviously from Samaria. And Jesus ends up saying, hey, you know, uh, go call your husband. He goes, I don't have one. And Jesus says, well, yeah, you've had five. And there's someone that you're living with right now that's not your husband. But go and call him. She leaves her water jar there, goes back to the village, come, go, go, and starts telling everybody, hey, there's this guy out at the well. He's told me all about my life. I know that I'm out, but somehow I feel like he wants me to be in, and maybe he wants more of us to be in. And uh, Jesus brings them in. He spends a number of hours with them talking about how they can be in. In the Gospel of Luke, uh, in Luke chapter 9, there's a, a, just a little bit before this, it says that Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem. And so it's a more than a day journey from wherever they were to going to Jerusalem. And so they're coming, and as they get to the end of the day, uh, Jesus sends a couple of his disciples, kind of scouts, to go into a Samaritan village and say, Hey, hey can we... Um, buy some food here and, and pay for some lodging so we can, uh, the, the people that we're with tonight can stay. The scouts come back and say, hey, the Samaritan village won't receive us. If you remember in Luke chapter 9, again, it's one of these things you can look up. Uh, you can uh, read that John and James, kind of, they, they get these nicknames that they're the sons of thunders. This is going to be the same John that is uh, in the Samaria, that goes to Samaria uh, but not too long after this whole thing. They go, Could, should we call down thunder and lightning and destroy this village? Just as Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, they won't receive you, Jesus. And we read, Jesus rebukes them. He's not offended that these people that are still out, won't receive him. Because he's thinking it won't be long until some of those people who are out will be in, even though they're Samaritans. Jesus always has this long-range look of, upon people with souls that matter to him, no matter how far out they are. He's always looking to the edge. And he wants us to look to that edge. And start inviting those people in. And then, the chapter right after that, and I don't think in all the years I really ever connected this. So here's this, you know, they wanted the, to, to call down fire. And then in chapter 10 of chapter Luke, uh, of Luke, the gospel of Luke, Jesus tells a parable. And it's the parable of the good Samaritan. And many of us know the parable. There is this Jewish man who's traveling. He gets um, uh, uh, robbed by some robbers, gets pummeled. I mean, gets his body kind of violence. And we know that there's two religious people that go by. The third person on the scene is a Samaritan, and he stops. And he touches the blood and the bruises. And then puts this broken, beaten up man on his own donkey and he walks. Walks him to the nearest place where he can get some care. He needs to go on with his business travels. But he says, here's some money, take care of him. And Jesus says, who was the one who was a neighbor to that broken man? And through their gritted teeth, some of these holy, righteous Jewish people have said, the one who helped him. They wouldn't even say the Samaritan. Jesus is preparing. And then in Luke chapter 17, we read uh, one more time about a Samaritan character. There are these 10 people, and they all have this dreaded disease of leprosy. And they come crying out to Jesus, and Jesus says, cleansed. Go and report to the priests so that you can enter back into the community of life. Enter back into your family. 
There's only one out of the ten that comes back. And kind of the assumption of that story is that probably all nine of the others were Jewish. But this one that comes back and falls down and thanks Jesus, Jesus points out, were there not ten all healed? Why is it that this one who is a foreigner, who is a Samaritan, is the only one who comes back? Again, Jesus is all about people that are out coming in. So now John and Peter, John, who was one of them that said, can we call down? He's in a Samaritan village. And he witnesses souls that are out coming in. That's the power of Jesus. So this is what we read, uh, picking up in verse 15. Uh, When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. Don't understand all that, but they had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, which is a great start. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Again, they're in, they're in, they're getting more in. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And he said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, and this is um, kind of a challenging answer, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. The gospel is working on Simon. He's believing this Jesus. But again, he's spent so many years, and we don't know why. I mean, did he have a, you know, sometimes people that kind of have a oversized ego or they kind of overcompensate for something that maybe happened in their childhood, And he's spent years and years kind of making a living out of deluding people, out of deceiving people, out of being... And he knows, he knows that he's using trickery. He knows, he knows that. So he knows that he's up against something, but maybe there's just a little more time. That he's kind of, he's he's across the edge, but maybe there's a little bit more that God needs to work on his heart to bring him in. And so Peter brings this out, that you're, I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Simon then says, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And Peter said, there's no way I'm praying for you. It's not what Peter said. I think he prayed for him. He said, Simon's heart could be healed just a little bit more. And he could realize that he was so far out. But he's in. And he's in. And he's in. And he's in. Verse 25 kind of gives us the summary. So when they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Because word would travel from village to village to village to village to village. You know how we felt we've been out for so many years? Because we're not pure Jews. We don't live in Jerusalem. I'm feeling like we're in. Something is changing. The circle is getting wider. I'm feeling like we're in. Again, today, we're still going to look to the edges. We're still going to realize how it is that the big C church is getting bigger. The circle is getting ever wider. In book and, and Acts chapter eight, and I'm just kind of going to go through this real quickly. Then um, we're going to watch a that, uh, AD Bible clip, and then the um, team's going to come out. We'll sing one more song, and we'll, we'll be done. In a couple of weeks, we're going to look at this story in a little more detail. But I just want to uh, quickly uh, go over it. Um, and so in Acts chapter eight, it says, "Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, again, this Philip, he's been the one that's kind of the main character in Acts. Chapter, well, Jesus is the main character, but Philip is a servant. So he says, go south to the road." The desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? 
the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. And this is about a passage written 600, 700 years before the day that they were presently in. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture from this Isaiah scroll. He was led like a, sl- a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip this question. Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. You've heard about this Jesus. You're a part of why he was crucified. But God raised him. Say you're sorry. Repent and follow Jesus with us. It's what matters most. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? How did he hear that you should be baptized? Either Philip told him, or he kind of already knew a part of that story of what had happened in Jerusalem on Pentecost Day. And so he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing because he knew he was out. And we're going to talk in a couple weeks kind of how far out he was. But now he realizes he's in. He's been baptized in. He's been jesus in. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. We're going to be a church that keeps looking to the edges because all of us at one time were across the edge. But the circle came and brought us in. We're going to be a church that believes the big C church, this kingdom of God that's ever warmly expanding in us, through us, all around us and way beyond us is all about bringing people out to in. We're going to watch a short clip of A.D. The Bible continues and someone that was out is going to be on the road 